The Quest of the Golden Fleece The first hero in Europe who undertook a great journey was the leader of the Quest of the Golden Fleece. He was supposed to have lived a generation earlier than the most famous Greek traveler, the hero of the Odyssey. It was, a, of course, a journey by water. Rivers, lakes, and seas were the only highways. There were no roads. All the same, a voyager had to face perils not only on the deep, but on the land as well. Ships did not sail by night, and any place where sailors put in might harbor a monster or a magician who could work more deadly harm than storm and shipwreck. High courage was necessary to travel, especially outside of Greece. No story proved this fact better than the account of what the heroes suffered who sailed in the ship Argo to find the Golden Fleece. It may be doubted, indeed, if there ever was a voyage on which sailors had to face so many and such varied dangers. However, they, all, they were all heroes of renown, some of them the greatest in Greece, and they were quite equal to their adventures. The tale of the Golden Fleece begins with a Greek king named Athamas, who got tired of his wife, put her away, and married another, the prince Aino. Nephili, the first wife, was afraid for her two children, especially the boy Phrixus. She thought the second wife would try to kill him so that her own son could inherit the kingdom, and she was right. The second wife came from a great family. Her father was Cadmus, the excellent king of Thebes. Her mother and her three sisters were women of blameless lives, but she herself, I know, determined to bring about the little boy's death, and she made an, an elaborate plan how this was to be done. Somehow she got possession of all the seed corn and parched it before the men went out for the sowing, so that, of course, there was no harvest at all. When the king sent a man to ask the oracle what he should do in this fearful distress, she persuaded, or more probably bribed the messenger, to say that the oracle had declared the corn would not grow again unless they offered up the young prince as a sacrifice. The people threatened with starvation forced the king to yield and permit the boy's death. To the later Greeks, the idea of such a sacrifice was as horrible as it is to us, and when it played a part in a story, they almost always changed it into something less shocking. As this tale has come down to us, when the boy had been taken to the altar a wondrous ram with a fleece of pure gold snatched him and his sister up and bore them away through the air. Hermes had sent him in answer to their mother's prayers. While they were crossing the strait which separates Europe and Asia, the girl, whose name was Heli, slipped and fell into the water. She was drowned. And the strait was named for her, the Sea of Heli, the Hellspont. The boy came safely to land to the country of Colchis, on the unfriendly sea, the Black Sea, which had not yet become friendly. The Colchians were a fierce people. Nevertheless, they were kind to Phrixus, and their king, Aetes, let him marry one of his daughters. It seemed odd that Phrixus sacrificed to Zeus the ram that had saved him in gratitude for having been saved, but he did so, and he gave the precious golden fleece to King Aetes. Phrixus had an uncle who was by rights a king in Greece, but had had his kingdom taken away from him by his nephew, a man named Pelias. The king's son, Jason, the rightful heir to the kingdom, had been sent secretly away to a place of safety, and when he was grown, he came boldly back to claim the kingdom from his wicked cousin. The usurper, Pelias, had been told by an oracle that he would die at the hands of kinsmen, and that he should be aware of anyone whom he saw shod with only a single sandal. In due time, such a man came to town. The one foot was bare, although in all other ways he was well clad, a garment fitting close to his splendid limbs, and around his, his shoulders a leopard's skin to turn the showers. He had not shorn the bright locks of his hair, they ran rippling down his back. He went straight into the town and entered the marketplace fearlessly at the time when the multitude filled it. None knew him, but one and another wondered at him and said, can he be Apollo, or Aphrodite's lord? Not one of Poseidon's bold sons, for they are dead. So they questioned each other. But Pelias came in hot haste at the tidings, and when he saw the single sandal, he was afraid. He hid his terror in his heart, however, and addressed the stranger. What country is your fatherland? No hateful and defiling lies, I beg you. Tell me the truth. With gentle words, the other answered. I have come to my home to recover the ancient honor of my house, 
This land no longer ruled a right which Zeus gave to my father. I am your cousin, and they call me by the name of Jason. You and I must rule ourselves by the law of right, not appeal to brazen swords or spears. Keep all the wealth you have taken, the flocks and the tawny herds of cattle in the fields, but the sovereign scepter and the throne release to me, so that no evil quarrel will arise from them. Pelias gave him a soft answer, so shall it be. But one thing f must first be done. The dead Phrixus bids us bring back the golden fleece and thus bring back his spirit to his home. The oracle has spoken. But for me, already old age is my companion, while the flower of your youth is only now coming into full bloom. Do you go upon this quest, and I swear with Zeus as witness that I will give up the kingdom and sovereign rule to you. So he spoke, believing in his heart that no one could make the attempt and come back alive. The idea of great adventure was delightful to Jason. He agreed and let it be known everywhere that this would be a voyage indeed. The young men of Greece joyfully met the challenge. They came, all the best and noblest, to join the company. Hercules, the greatest of all heroes, was there. Orpheus, the master mu musician, Castor with his brother Pollux, Achilles' father, Peleus, and many another. Hera was helping Jason, and it was she who kindled in each one the desire not to be left behind nursing a life without peril by his mother's side, but even at the price of death to drink with his comrades the peerless elixir of valor. They set sail in the ship Argo. Jason took in his hands a golden goblet and, pouring a libation of wine into the sea, called upon Zeus, whose lance is the lightning, to speed them on their way. Great perils lay before them, and some of them paid with their lives for drinking that peerless elixir. They put in first at Lemnos, a strange island where only women lived. They had risen up against the men and had killed them all, except one, the old king. His daughter, Hypsiple, a leader among the women, had spared her father and set him afloat on the sea in a hollow chest which finally carried him to safety. These fierce creatures, however, welcomed the Argonauts and helped them with good gifts of food and wine and garments before they sailed away. Soon after they left Lemnos, the Argonauts lost Hercules from the company. A lad named Hylas, his armor-bearer, very dear to him, was drawn under the water as he dipped his pitcher in a spring by a water nymph who saw the rosy flush of his beauty and wished to kiss him. She threw her arms around his neck and drew him down into the depths, and he was seen no more. Hercules sought him madly everywhere, shouting his name and plunging deeper and deeper into the forest away from the sea. He had forgotten the fleece and the Argo and his comrades, everything, everything except Hylas. He did not come back, and finally the ship had to sail without him. Their next adventure was with the harpies, frightful flying creatures with hooked beaks and claws who always left behind them a loathsome stench, sickening to all living creatures. Where the Argonauts had beached their boat for the night lived a lonely and wretched old man to whom Apollo, the truth-teller, had given the gift of prophecy. He foretold unerringly what would happen, and this had displeased Zeus, who always liked to wrap in mystery what he would do, and very sensibly, too, in the opinion of all who knew Hera. So he inflicted a terrible punishment upon the old man. Whenever he was about to dine, the harpies, who were called the Hounds of Zeus, swooped down and defiled the food, leaving it so foul that no one could bear to be near it, much less eat it. When the Argonauts saw the poor old creature, his name was Phineas, he was like a lifeless dream, creeping on withered feet, trembling for weakness, and only the skin on his body held his bones together. He welcomed them gladly and begged them to help him. He knew through his gift of prophecy that he could be defended from the harpies by two men alone, who were among the company on the Argo, the sons of Boreas, the great north wind. All listened to him with pity, and the two gave him eagerly their promise to help. While the others set foot forth food for him, Boreas's sons took their stand beside him with drawn swords. He had hardly put a morsel to his lips when the hateful monsters darted down from the sky, and in a moment had devoured everything that were flying off, leaving the intolerable order, odor behind them. But the wind-swift sons of the north wind followed them. They caught up with them and struck at them with their swords. They would assuredly have cut them 
to pieces if Iris, the rainbow messenger of gods, gliding down from heaven, had not checked them. They must forbear to kill the hounds of Zeus, she said, but she swore by the waters of the Styx, the oath that none can break, that they would never again trouble Phineas. So the two returned gladly and comforted the old man, who in his joy sat feasting with the heroes all through the night. He gave them wise advice, too, about the dangers before them, in especial about the clashing rocks, the simple gades that rolled perpetually against one another while the sea boiled up around them. The way to pass between them, he said, was first to make trial with a dove. If she passed through safely, then the chances were that they too would get through. But if the dove were crushed, they must turn back and give up all hope of the golden fleece. The next morning they started with a dove, of course, and were soon in sight of the great rolling rocks. It seemed impossible that there could be a way between them, but they freed the dove and watched her. She flew through and came out safe. Only the tips of her tail feathers were caught between the rocks as they rolled back together, and those were torn away. The heroes went after her as swiftly as they could. The rocks parted, the ro rowers put forth all their strength, and they too came through safely. Just in time, however, for as the rocks clashed together again, the extreme end of the stern ornament was shorn off. By so little they escaped destruction. But ever since they passed them, the rocks have been rooted fast to each other and have never any more brought disaster to sailors. Not far from there was a country of the warrior women, the Amazons. The daughters, strangely enough, of that most peace-loving nymph, sweet, sweet Harmony. But their father was Ares, the terrible god of war, whose ways they followed and not their mothers. The heroes would gladly have halted and closed in battle with them, and it would not have been a battle without bloodshed, for the Amazons were not gentle foes. But the wind was favorable, and they hurried on. They caught a glimpse of the Caucasus as they sped past, and of Prometheus on his rock high above them, and they heard the fanning of the eagle's huge wings as it darted down to its bloody feast. They stopped for nothing, and that same day at sunset they reached Colchis, the country of the Golden Fleece. They spent the night facing they knew not what, and feeling that there was no help from for them anywhere except in their own valor. Up in Olympus, however, a consultation was being held about them. Hera, troubled at the danger they were in, went to ask Aphrodite's help. The goddess of love was surprised at the visit, for Hera was no friend of hers. Still, when the great queen of Olympus begged for her aid, she was awed and promised to do all she could. Together they planned that Aphrodite's son, Cupid, should make the daughter of the Colchian king fall in love with Jason. That was an excellent plan for Jason. The maiden, who was named Medea, knew how to work very powerful magic and could undoubtedly save the Argonauts if she would use her dark knowledge for them. So Aphrodite went to Cupid and told him she would give him a lovely plaything, a ball of shining gold and deep blue enamel, if he would do what she wanted. He was delighted, seized his bow and quiver, and swept down from Olympus through the vast expanse of air to Colchis. Meantime, the heroes had started for the city to ask the king for the golden fleece. They were safe from any trouble on the way, for Hera wrapped them in a thick mist so that they reached the palace unseen. It dissolved when they approached the entrance, and the warders, quick to notice the band of splendid young strangers, led them courteously, courteously within and sent word to the king of their arrival. He came at once and bade them welcome. His servants hastened to make all ready, build fires and heat water for the baths, and prepare food. Into the, this busy scene stole the princess Medea, curious to see the visitors. As her eyes fell upon Jason, Cupid swiftly drew his bow and shot a shaft deep into Medea's, into the maiden's heart. It burned there like a flame, and her soul melted with sweet pain, and her face went now white, now red. Amazed and abashed, she stole back to her chamber. Only after the heroes had bathed and refreshed themselves with meat and drink could King Aedes ask them who they were and why they had come. It was accounted great discourtesy to put any question to a guest before his wants had been satisfied. Jason answered that they were all men of noblest birth, sons of or grandsons of the gods, 
who had sailed from Greece in the hope that he would give them the golden fleece in return for whatever service he would ask of them. They would conquer his enemies for him or do anything he wished. A great anger filled King Aedes' heart as he listened. He did not like foreigners any more than the Greeks did. He wanted them to keep away from his country, and he said to himself, If these strangers had not eaten at my table, I would kill them. In silence, he pondered what he should do, and a plan came to him. He told Jason that he bore no grudge against brave men, and that if they proved themselves such, he would give the fleece to them. And the trial of your courage, he said, shall be only that I myself have done. This was to yoke two bulls he had, whose feet were of bronze and whose breath was flaming fire, and with them to plow a field. Then the teeth of a dragon must be cast into the furrows like seed corn, which would spring up at, at once into a crop of armed men. These must be cut down as they advanced to the attack, a fearful harvesting. I have done all this myself, he said, and I will give the fleece to no man less brave than I. For a time Jason sat speechless. The contest seemed impossible, beyond the strength of anyone. Finally he answered, I will make the trial, monstrous though it is, even if it is my doom to die. With that he rose up and led his comrades back to the ship for the night, but Medea's thoughts followed after him. All through the long night, when he had left the palace, she seemed to see him, his beauty and his grace, and to hear the words he had uttered. Her heart was tormented with fear for him. She guessed what her father was planning. Returned to the ship, the heroes held a council, and one another urged Jason to let him take the trial upon himself, but in vain. Jason would yield to none of them. As they talked, there came to them one of king, the king's grandsons, whose life Jason once had saved, and he told them of Medea's magic power. There was nothing she could not do, he said, check the stars even, and the moon. If she were persuaded to help, she could make Jason able to conquer the bulls and the dragon teeth men. It seemed the only plan that offered any hope, and they urged the prince to go back and try to win Medea over, not knowing that the god of love had already done that. She sat alone in her room, weeping, telling herself she was ashamed forever because she cared so much for a stranger that she wanted to yield to a mad passion and go, go against her father. Far better die, she said. She took, her she took in her hand a cask casket which held herbs for killing. But as she sat there with it, she thought of life and the delightful things that are in the world, and the sun seemed sweeter than ever before. She put the casket away, and no longer wavering, she determined to use her power for the man she loved. She had a magic ointment which would make him who rubbed it on his body safe for that day. He could not be harmed by anything. The plant it was made from sprang up first when Prometheus's blood dripped down upon the earth. She put it in her bosom and went to find her nephew, the prince whom Jason had helped. She met him as he was looking for her to beg her to do just what she had already decided on. She agreed at once to all he said and sent him to the ship to tell Jason to meet her without delay in a certain place. As soon as he heard the message, Jason started, and as he went, Hera shed radiant grace upon him so that all who saw him marveled at him. When he reached Medea, it seemed to her as if her heart left her to go to him. A dark mist clouded her eyes, and she had no strength to move. The two stood face to face without a word, as lofty pine trees when the wind is still. Then again, when the wind stirs, they murmur. So these two, also stirred by the breath of love, were fated to tell out all their tale to each other. He spoke first and implored her to be kind to him. He could not but have hope, he said, because her loveliness must surely mean that she excelled in gentle courtesy. She did not know how to speak to him. She wanted to pour out all she felt at once. Silently, she drew the box of ointment from her bosom and gave it to him. She would have given her soul to him if he had asked her, and now both were fixing their eyes on the ground, abashed, and again were throwing glances at each other, smiling with love's desire. At last Medea spoke and told him how to use the charm and that when it was sprinkled on his weapons, 
it would make them as well as himself invincible for a day. If too many of the dragon teeth men rushed to attack him, he must throw a stone into their midst, which would make them turn against each other and fight until all were killed. I must go back to the palace now, she said. But when you are once more safe at home, remember Medea, as I will remember you forever. He answered passionately, Never by night and never by day will I forget you. If you will come to Greece, you shall be worshipped for what you have done for us, and nothing except death will come between us. They parted, she to the palace to weep over her treachery to her father, he to the ship to send two of his comrades for the dragon's teeth. Meantime he made trial of the ointment, and at the touch of it a terrible irresistible power entered into him, and the heroes all exulted. Yet even so, when they reached the field where the king and the Colchians were waiting, and the bulls rushed out of their lair, breathing forth fame, flames of fire, terror overcame them. But Jason withstood the fearful creatures as a great rock in the sea withstands the waves. He forced first one and then the other down on its knees and fastened the yoke upon them, while all wondered at his mighty prowess. Over the field he drove them, pressing the plow down firmly and casting the dragon's teeth into the furrows. By the time the plowing, plowing was done, the crop was springing up, men bristling with arms who came rushing to attack him. Jason remembered Medea's words and flung a huge stone into their midst. With that, the warriors turned upon each other and fell beneath their own spears, while the furrows ran with blood. So Jason's contest was ended in victory, bitter to King Aetes. The king went back to the palace, planning treachery against the heroes and vowing they should never have the Golden Fleece. But Hera was working for them. She made Medea, all bewildered with love and misery, determined to fly with Jason. That night she stole out of the house and sped along the dark path to the ship, where they were rejoicing in their good fortune with no thought of evil. She fell on her knees before them and begged them to take her with them. They must get the fleece at once, she told them, and then make all haste away or they would be killed. A terrible serpent guarded the fleece, but she would lull it to sleep so that it would do them no harm. She spoke in anguish, but Jason rejoiced and raised her gently and embraced her and promised her she would be his own wedded wife when once they were back in Greece. Then taking her on board, they went where she directed and reached the sacred grove where the fleece hung. The guardian serpent was very terrible, but Medea approached it fearlessly, and singing a sweet magical song, she charmed it to sleep. Swiftly, Jason lifted the golden wonder from the tree it hung on, and hurrying back, they reached the ship as dawn was breaking. The strongest were putting were put at the oars, and they rowed with all their might down the river to the sea. By now, what had happened was known to the king, and he sent his son in pursuit, Medea's brother, Aphristus. He led an army so great that it seemed impossible for the little band of heroes either to conquer it or to escape, but Medea saved them again, this time by a horrible deed. She killed her brother. Some say she sent him word that she was longing to go back to her home and that she had fled, she had the fleece for him, if he would meet her that night at a certain spot. He came all unsuspecting and Jason struck him down and his dark blood dyed his sister's silvery robe as she shrank away. With its leader dead, the army scattered in disorder, and the way to the sea lay open to the heroes. Others say that Aphristus set sail on the Argo with Medea, although why he did so is not explained, and that it was the king who pursued them. As his ship gained on them, Medea herself struck her brother down, and cutting him limb from limb, cast the pieces into the sea. The king stopped to gather them, and the Argo was saved. By then, the adventures of the Argonauts were almost over. One terrible trial they had while passing between the smooth, sheer rock of Scylla and the whirlpool of Charybdis, where the, sea, where the sea forever spouted and roared, and the furious waves mounting up touched the very sky. But Hera had seen to it that the sea nymphs should be at hand to guide them and send the ship on to safety. Next came Crete, where they would have landed but for Medea. She told them that Talus lived there, the last man left of the ancient bronze race, a creature made 
all of bronze except one ankle where alone he was vulnerable. Even as she spoke, he appeared terrible to behold, and threatened to crush the ship with rocks if they drew nearer. They rested on their oars, and Medea, Medea kneeling, prayed to the hounds of Hades to come and destroy him. The dread powers of evil heard her. As a bronze man lifted a pointed crag to hurl it at the Argo, he, gra he grazed his ankle, and the blood gushed forth until he sank and died. Then the heroes could land and refresh themselves for the voyage still before them. Upon reaching Greece, they disbanded, each hero going to his home, and Jason with Medea took the Golden Fleece to Pelias. But they found that terrible deeds had been done there. Pelias had forced Jason's father to kill himself, and his mother had died of grief. Jason, bent upon punishing this wickedness, turned to Medea for help, which had never failed him. She brought about the death of Pelias by a cunning trick. To his daughter, she said that she knew a secret, how to make the old young again. And to prove her words, she cut up before them a ram, worn out with many years, and put the pieces into a pot of boiling water. Then she uttered a charm, and in a moment, out from the vapor water, sprang a lamb and ran frisking away. The maidens were convinced. Medea gave Pelias a potent sleeping draught and called upon his daughters to cut him into bits. With all their longing to make him young again, they could hardly force themselves to do so. But at last the dreadful task was done, the pieces in the water, and they looked to Medea to speak the magic words that would bring him back to them and to his youth. But she was gone, gone from the palace and from the city, and horrified they realized that they were their father's murderer. Jason was revenged indeed. There is a story too that Medea restored Jason's father to life and made him young again, and that she gave to Jason the secret of perpetual youth. All that she did of evil and of good was done for him alone, and in the end, all the reward she got was that he turned traitor to her. They came to Corinth after Pelias' death. Two sons were born to them, and all seemed well, even to Medea in her exile, lonely as exile must always be. But her great love for Jason made the loss of her family and her country seem to her a little thing, and then Jason showed them the meanness that was in him brilliant hero though he had seemed to be. He engaged himself to marry the daughter of the king of Corinth. It was a splendid marriage, and he thought of ambition only, never of love or of gratitude. In the first amazement at his treachery and, and in the passion of her anguish, Medea let fall words which made the king of Corinth fear she would do harm to his daughter. He must have been a singularly unsuspicious man not to have thought of that before, and he sent her word that she and her sons must leave the country at once. That was a doom almost as bad as death. A woman in exile with little helpless children had no protection for herself or them. As she sat brooding over what she should do and thinking of her wrongs and her wretchedness, wishing for death to end the life she could no longer bear, sometimes remembering with tears her father and her home, sometimes shuddering at the stain nothing could wash out of her brother's blood, of Pelias's too, conscious above all of the wild passion, passionate devotion that had brought her to this evil and this misery. As she sat thus, Jason appeared before her. She looked at him, she did not speak. He was there beside her, yet she was far away from him, alone with her outraged love and her ruined life. His feelings had nothing in them to make him silent. He told her coldly that he had always known how uncontrolled her spirit was. If it had not been for her foolish, mischievous talk about his bride, she might have stayed uncomfortably in Corinth. However, he had done his best for her. It was entirely through his efforts that she was only to be exiled, not killed. He had had a very hard time indeed to persuade the king, but he had spared no pains. He had come to her now because he was not a man to fail a friend, and he would see that she had plenty of gold and everything necessary for her journey. This was too much. The torrent of Medea's wrongs burst forth. You come to me, she said, to me of all the race of men, yet it is well you came. For I shall ease the burden of my heart if I can make 
your baseness manifest. I saved you. Every man in Greece knows that. The bulls, the dragon men, the serpent warder of the fleece, I conquered them. I made you victor. I held the light that saved you. Father and home, I left them for a strange country. I overthrew your foes, contrived for Pelias the worst of deaths. Now you forsake me. Where shall I go? Back to my father's house, to Pelias' daughters? I have become for you the enemy of all. Myself, I had no quarrel with them. Oh, I have had in you a loyal husband to be admired of men. An exile now, O oh God, O oh God. No one to help, I am alone. His answer was that he had been saved not by her, but by Aphrodite, who had made her fall in love with him, and that she owed a great deal for bringing her to Greece, a civilized country. Also that he had done very well for her in letting it be known how she had helped the Argonauts so that people praised her. If only she ha could have had some common sense, she would have been glad of his marriage, as such a connection would have been profitable for her and the children too. Her exile was her own fault only. Whatever else she lacked, Medea had plenty of intelligence. She wasted no more words upon him except to refuse his gold. She would take nothing, no help from him. Jason flung away angrily from her. Your stubborn pride, he told her. It drives away all those who would be kind, but you will grieve the more for it. From that moment, Medea set her, herself to be re revenged as well she knew how. By death, oh by death, shall the conflict of life be decided. Life's little day ended. She determined to kill Jason's bride, and then, then... But she would not think of what else she saw before her. Her death first, she said. She took from a chest a most lovely robe. This she anointed with deadly drugs and placing it in a casket, she sent her sons with it to the new bride. They must ask her, she told them, to show that she accepted the gift by wearing it at once. The princess received them graciously and agreed. But no sooner had she put it on than a fearful devouring fire enveloped her. She dropped dead. Her very flesh had melted away. When Medea knew the deed was done, she turned her mind to one still more dreadful. There was no protection for her children, no help from them anywhere. A slave's life might be theirs, nothing more. I will not let them live for strangers to ill use, she thought. To die by others' hands more merciless than mine, no. I who gave them life will give them death. Oh, now no cowardice, no thought how young they are, how dear they are, how when they were first born, not that. I will forget they are my sons. One moment, one short moment, then forever sorrow. When Jason came, full of fury for what she had done to his bride and determined to kill her, the two boys were dead, and Medea on the roof of the house was stepping into a chariot drawn by dragons. They carried her away through the air out of his sight as he cursed her, never himself, for what had come to pass. <laughs>